Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna Maharaj, obeisances. Looks like he cannot hear us. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can you hear us? We can hear you clearly. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. All right, we'll begin. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Jaksuru Nilitangi Nathas My Shri Recording in progress. Namaha. Pancha kaupata rupias cha kripa sindhu bhai eva cha patita nam pavane pyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. We're reading Sri Ishopanishad and we're up to mantra number 10. So beginning this evening with mantra number 10. Anyad Anyad Evahur Abhidhyaya Anyad Ahur Abhidhyaya Iti Sushru Madhiranam Yenastat Vichakshakshare Translation The wise have explained that one result is obtained from the culture of nation from the culture of knowledge and that a different result is obtained from the culture of nations. So not a very difficult conclusion. You get one result by culturing knowledge and you get a different result by culturing nations or avidya. So Prabhupada begins the purport by listing the different qualities which are mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, mentioned in chapter 13, verses 8 to number 12. There are the different items of knowledge, 18 different items are mentioned. So Srila Prabhupada has explained each of them in his own way. And you can refer to the Bhagavad Gita and you'll see, for example, the first one, one should become a perfect gentleman and learn to give proper respect to others. So that this, this refers to the quality of being humble and pr without pride. And so then Prabhupada goes on mentioning all the different qualities of one in knowledge. Second thing, one should not pose himself as a religionist simply for name and fame. Third, one should not become a source of anxiety to others by the action of his body, by the thoughts of his mind, or by his words. Number four, one should learn forbearance even in the face of provocation from others. Number five, one should learn to avoid duplicity in the 
dealings with others. Six, one should search out a bona fide spiritual master who can lead him gradually to the stage of spiritual realization. And one must submit himself to such a spiritual master, render him service and ask him and ask relevant questions. So number six is an important quality, the importance of having a spiritual master and the process also of approaching him. Then number seven, in order to approach the platform of self-realization, one must follow the regulative principles enjoined in the revealed scriptures. Number eight, one must be fixed in the tenets of the revealed scriptures. Number nine, one should completely refrain from practices which are detrimental to the interests of self-realization. Number 10, one should not accept more than he requires for the maintenance of his body. 11, one should not falsely identify himself with the gross material body, nor should one consider those who are related to the body to be his own. Number 12, one should always remember that as long as he has a material body, he must face the miseries of repeated birth, old age, disease, and death. There is no use in making plans to get rid of these miseries of the material body. The best course is to find out the means by which one may regain his spiritual identity. Thirteen, one should not be attached to more than the necessities of life required for spiritual advancement. Fourteen, one should not be more attached to wife children and home than the revealed scriptures ordain. 15. One should not be happy or distressed over desirable and undesirable, knowing that such feelings are just created by the mind. 16. One should not become, oh, one should become an unalloyed devotee of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, and serve him with rapt attention. 17. One should develop a liking for residence in a secluded place with a calm and quiet atmosphere, favorable for spiritual culture, and one should avoid congested places where non-devotees congregate. Finally, 18, one should become, one should become a scientist or philosopher and conduct research into spiritual knowledge recognizing that spiritual knowledge is permanent, whereas material knowledge ends with the death of the body. So Prabhupada has given us some elaboration into the meaning of these different items which are all listed there in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada continues, he said, these 18 items combine to form a gradual process by which the knowledge 
by which real knowledge can be developed except for though except for those all other methods are considered to be in the category of nashines srila bhaktivinoda thakur a great acharya maintained that all forms of material knowledge are merely external features of the illusory energy and that by culturing them one becomes no better than an ass so shila bhaktivinoda thakur is described like this the culture of material knowledge makes you no better than an ass yashatma buddhi guna petri ta kute svadi kala tradish uboma ijadi yatitta buddhi shalale nakarachat janeshva vigneshu sai vagokaraha so that's the verse shila bhakti vinoda has given us a similar meaning to this verse which i just quoted from shrimad bhagavatam which says if we think of ourselves to be the body if we think of ourselves as belonging to a particular place of our birth uh, if we go to a holy place just simply to take a bath there and not to hear from the saintly people then we're no better than the foolish animal like a cow or an ass the cow or the ass they are in the, of course the in the bodily conception of life so if we identify it like that the bodily concept of life then there's no difference between us and the at the cow or the ass so it's not a great credit this is the culture of nations Prabhupada continues this same principle is found here in Sri Ishopanishad by advancement of material knowledge modern man is simply being converted into an ass some materialistic politicians decry the the present system of civilization as satanic but unfortunately they do not care about the culture of real knowledge as it is described in bhagavad gita thus they cannot change the satanic situation in the modern society even a boy thinks himself self sufficient and pays no respect to elderly men due to the wrong type of education being imparted in our universities boys all over the world are giving their elders headaches thus shri ishampanishad very strongly warns that the culture of nation is different from that of knowledge the universities are so to speak centers of nations only consequently scientists are busy discovering lethal weapons to wipe out the existence of other countries university students today are not given instruction in the regulated principles of brahmacharya nor do they have any faith in any scriptural injunctions religious principles are taught for the sake of name and fame only and not for the sake of practical action thus there is animosity not only in social and political fields but in the field of religion 
as well. So, Prabhupada is describing the situation in the world today. The, there's ja just a total lack of proper education. The young men, young people in general, if you talk about practicing brahmacharya, observing celibacy, they laugh. They think it's a joke. They cannot imagine. Even young young girls, unmarried girls in the schools, that they have no proper education. And they come to school often pregnant. So this is the situation in the Kali Yoga. Young boys never learn to control the mind or senses. They never heard of such a thing as Brahmacharya. They could not even imagine it. So, now, Srila Prabhupada, however, tried, did his best to try to introduce these things to people. He saw the situation. Of course, this, these purports to the Ishopanishad here, they were written before Prabhupada even, even went to the West. So, even before he went to the West, he saw, he'd seen the deterioration in the human civilization. He, he could see even in his own native land of India how degraded the situation was becoming. The young women, they don't even know how to wear a sari. The young men never wore a dhoti in their life. People have to be educated in these things. They don't know how to eat properly. They will eat. Every, everyone is a meat eater. So when they, when they eat, they eat with two hands. So the modern society is uh, in such a condition that it, it's so degraded. It's not a very pleasant situation for young people to grow up in. They have to grow up in a society where there's pornography and uh, all kinds of obscene literature. And it's considered normal to look at these things and to take pleasure in them. So we're trying to encourage people in another way of life that there is an alternative to these things. It's not that everybody has to be on the level of uh, hogs and dogs and camels and nasties. There are books for the, the, the swans and there are books for the people like crows. So not everyone is a crow. There are swan-like people and we have to encourage these kind of people. We have to try to distribute books and literature to give the people the chance to, to hear transcendental knowledge. So Prabhupada is describing more about the, the social condition in the world today. He says, nationalism has developed in different parts of the world due to the cultivation of nations by the general people. No one considers that this tiny earth 
is just a lump of matter floating in an immeasurable space along with many other lumps. In, in comparison to the vastness of space, these material lumps are like dust particles in the air. Because God has kindly made these lumps of matter complete in themselves, they are perfectly equipped with all necessities for floating in space. The drivers of our spaceships may be very proud of their achievements, but they do not consider the supreme driver of these greater, more gigantic spaceships called planets. There are innumerable suns and innumerable planetary systems also, as infinitesimal parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. We, small creatures, are trying to dominate the unlimited planets. Thus, we take repeated birth and death and are generally frustrated by old age and disease. The span of human life is scheduled for about a hundred years, although it is gradually decreasing to twenty or thirty years. Thanks to the culture of nations, befooled men have created their own nations within these planets in order to grasp sense enjoyment more effectively for these few years. Such foolish people draw up various plans to render national demarcations perfectly, a task that is totally impossible. Yet, for this purpose, each and every nation has become a source of anxiety for others. More than 50% of a nation's energy is devoted to defense measures and thus spoiled. No one cares for the cultivation of real knowledge. Yet people are falsely proud of being advanced in both the material and the spiritual knowledge. So, most symptoms of the Kali Yuga are being described. Uh, the foolish pride of the people that some we, 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 we do see that we get people that, as Prabhupada describes, that. They claim that they're both that they they claim they're advanced in both material and spiritual knowledge, although they know nothing of what is matter and what is spirit, and who's the controller of both. But they like the idea, that, and people do like to be a little proud and pretend that they know something. So, our position in the material world is very uh, minute, we're very small, very insignificant, but still the nature of the false ego and the pride of each and every one of us is that we will take the role that we know something, we have some, we've done something, Actually, we've done very little, but we need to take advantage of this human life to hear and to learn. So, this is the real focus in this section of the Ishopanishad, and we will hear more uh, of what is actually expected from a civilized human being. Srila Prabhupada continues, the Sri Upanishad warns us of this faulty type of education and the Bhagavad Gita gives instruction as to the development of real knowledge. 
This mantra states that the instructions of Vidya must be acquired from Adira. Adira is one who is not disturbed by material illusion. No one can be undisturbed unless he is perfectly spiritually realized, at which time one neither hankers nor laments for anything. Adira realizes that the material body and mind he has acquired by chance through material association are but foreign elements. Therefore, he simply makes the best use of a bad bargain. So, this is a very nice, actually, very interesting how Srila Prabhupada describes the situation here. He's describing, first of all, that the human being needs to get instruction. He has to get transcendental knowledge, what we call vidya. And to get that education in vidya, he has to get the guidance of a, well, a, a person who is described, Prabhupada uses the term dira, dira, meaning sober-minded. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, dira tatra namuyati. So dira, meaning sober, it's not disturbed by the material energy. It doesn't hanker or lament. Hmm. As Prabhupada says, Adira realizes that he is not the body. So he's not disturbed by the problems of the body. And Prabhupada says, he makes the best use of a bad bargain. The bad bargain was that we acquired the material body. Material body means it's subject to the material energy and the pushings of the material senses. But the best use of it is that we use it to hear and to learn how to take up devotional service. So we will hear more. The material body and mind are bad bargains for the spiritual living entity. The living entity has actual functions in the living spiritual world. But this material world is dead. As long as the living spiritual sparks manipulate the dead lumps of matter, the dead world appears to be a living world. Actually, it is the living souls, the parts and parcels of the supreme living being who move the world. The Diras have come to know all these facts by hearing them from superior authorities and have realized this knowledge by following the regulated principles. So Prabhupada's describing the qualification of the dira. He's describing also the nature of the material world. The material world's like a dead world, like everything is dead, just simply matter. But when it's in contact with the spiritual spark, then it appears to have life. So it's the spiritual spark which gives life to the dead matter. Prabhupada continues, to follow the regulated principles, one must take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master. The transcendental message and regulated principles come from the spiritual master to the disciple. Such knowledge does not come in the hazardous way of nascent education. One can become a dira only by submissively hearing 
from a bona fide spiritual master. Arjuna, for example, became a dira by submissively hearing Lord Krishna, the personality of God himself. Thus the perfect disciple must be like Arjuna, and the spiritual master must be as good as the Lord himself. This is a process of learning vidya, knowledge, from the dira, the undisturbed. So Srila Prabhupada's <laughs> nice uh, point here that the perfect teacher is Lord Krishna himself. And if you want a teacher like Lord Krishna, then you should be a perfect disciple, perfect student, just as Arjuna was a perfect student. So when you have the perfect teacher and the perfect student, then you get transmission of transcendental knowledge. If you, you may have a good teacher, but if the student said, if the student doesn't want to learn, then it will be a very difficult task for any teacher. If the student is rebellious, if the student doesn't want to hear, doesn't want to do anything, then it doesn't matter how good the teacher is, it won't, the, the education process will not take effect. You must, the, the student must be willing to hear and to apply the, the teachings, take the instructions. So the teacher must be qualified and the student also must be qualified. So Prabhupada is making that point here that Arjuna was qualified as a student. He heard carefully. And Lord Krishna, of course, he is certainly qualified as the best of all teachers. So where you have the best teacher with the best student, then certainly the transmission of knowledge will be very successful. So Lord Krishna was able to give full instruction to Arjuna and to enlighten him on the spiritual path. And Prabhupada also makes the point is that anyone can become a dira, but you have to hear submissively from a bona fide spiritual teacher. So not everyone wants to become a dira, uh, a, a sober-minded person. Not everyone is willing. Just like it said, anyone can become a brahmana if they're properly initiated and trained. But not everyone wants to be initiated and trained. So it's not that everyone, just anyone and everyone can become a dira or a brahmana. They have to be willing to accept the process. Okay. And then finally, in this purport, a, a dira or one who has not, oh, an an adira, one who has not undergone the training of a dira, cannot be an instructive leader. Modern politicians who pose themselves as diras are actually adiras, and one cannot expect perfect knowledge from them. They are simply busy seeing to their own remuneration in dollars and cents. How then can they lead the mass of people to the right path of self-realization? Thus, one must hear submissively from a dira in order to attain actual education. So Srila Prabhupada is describing that 
if somebody is not a, a dira, if he is not sober-minded, if he has not got control over his mind and senses and so on, then he cannot be a leader. He cannot be a res take any responsibility in society. Responsibility meaning like a teacher or a father even or a husband. You have to be sober-minded. You have to be control over senses. Uh, and somebody who is materialistic minded, who is business, who is in the business, is simply thinking how much money he will make. Then this person is also not a qualified person. He is simply a materialistic person. And the bodily concept of life is only interested in his own sense gratification. Such a person shouldn't be accepted as a leader. All right, so these are some points in mantra number 10. Are there any questions on mantra number 10? Anybody has any questions on mantra number 10? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, there is eight, there are eighteen points, and one of the points is to avoid duplicity. Yes. Uh, what is it, Guru Maharaj? Uh, avoid duplicity. To avoid duplicity, well, to be duplicitous means to say to say one thing and to do another. Okay, yeah, okay. You, you, admit, you may say, just like you may say, oh, everyone should be honest and straightforward. But if you're not honest yourself, but you're telling everyone else to be honest, then that is duplicitous. Okay, Guru Maharaj, I understand. It is, uh, to be duplicitous is uh, to, 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 to claim to you, or you may claim to represent something, but you act in a different way within your own. You know, you, you, yeah. you talk, you talk about doing good, but you, you simply just do harm to others. So it doesn't create an, it doesn't create the proper mood. Du somebody's duplicitous. Yeah. They talk, talk just like somebody may be politician and may be speaking that he's interested in doing good for the country, but at the same time he's only thinking about his own money, how much money he can get for himself. Mm. So that is duplicitous. He's got uh, some other purpose in mind. He may be talking about doing good for this country, and good for the his humanity, but at the same time he's thinking only about himself. So that is duplicitous. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I understand. And uh, one one of the points they are telling the we should not try to harm uh, others by the by body actions and thoughts of the mind. I was thinking uh, in Kali Yuga, the thoughts are not counted, right, Guru Maharaj? Can we actually arm others by the thoughts? Well, you have. We have to accept that the, the things which are in our mind, they're they're going to become the actions. Action. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And this, you know, it's not just going to stay in the mind, but generally the things which are there in the mind. They're going to be the cause of your actions. You know, you yeah, you think about yeah, yeah. You, you think about doing things, and you, you know you go and do it. The thought comes in your mind, and you go and do it. Mm. So, yeah, yes, initially but... people are thinking; they th they think about it. We have to. We have to learn uh, to 
reject the bad thoughts when they come in the mind. But not everybody is aware of that. No, not everyone thinks like that. Something comes in the mind and then they go and do it. They, yeah, don't, right. they, don't, they don't check themselves. So there has to be mental control there. Yeah. Yeah, you got it? Yeah, Guru Maharaj, got it, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Uh, regarding nationalism, I wanted to just say a comment that uh, we kept Govardhan Puja and uh, most of the Indian people, they wanted to wa watch the India, India cricket match and they didn't come. And some people who also came to the puja, they were watching the cricket match at the during the puja. It was like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. The modern people are like that, you know, they're, they're mixed devotees, you see. Yeah. They, have some de they have some devotion, but they have a lot of other things in their mind as well. Yes, Guru Maharaj. We have to, we have to just, you know, recognize yeah, that. Yeah, they told they wanted to support the country by watching the match and just. Uh, yeah, you know they, they have they have no real purpose in life, you know, other than to watch people play cricket. <laughs> that's their that's that's what they think. That is their sense gratification. That is their happiness. That is their pleasure in life. <laughs> you can understand, you know, their the level of consciousness is not very high, that they, they get so much pleasure and happiness from just playing games like cricket. So this is their, this is their uh, level of sense, sense pleasure, sense enjoyment. Mm -hmm. It's not, yes. not a very high level of enjoyment. Yeah. But for some people, this is, you know, what's the harm? They're thinking, what's the harm? Prahlad Maharaj describes like that, you know, young boys, they will play with balls, they play football, they play cricket, they play these different games. You know, young boys, they spend so many years of their life growing up, chasing after the ball and hitting the ball. And some people, of course, make a lot of money doing these things. And for others, it, it's just simply their enjoyment to watch it. And, and they do it in the guise of nationalism, our, our cricket team, our country. <laughs> and yeah. people, feel, people feel pleasure, they feel pride that we won. Our country won. We were the best. We were the best at hitting the ball and running after the ball. It, it takes some time to grow out of these things. You know, people get conditioned to them. Yeah, yes, Guru Maharaj. So... We need to let pe more people read Srimad Bhagavatam and then they all realize about how to make better use of the human life and to use the time for higher purposes. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Any other question?
Well, we can rec recommend them to read the Srimad Bhagavatam. And you can recommend them to follow four regulative principles. You can recommend them to chant Hare Krishna and purify their senses a little. We try to encourage people to chant Hare Krishna and to get a taste for these things. If people will chant the Maha Mantra and uh, take Krishna Prasadam, then it can help them to develop a taste. When Srila Prabhupada went to America, of course, the young people, you know, they were not also uh, very pious or cultured, but Prabhupada arranged to give them nice prasadam and taught them also the chanting of Hare Krishna. And uh, he was able to change them. So it, it's not so much giving them instructions, but it's giving them a, an opportunity to purify themselves through chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and through uh, uh, and, and giving them nice uh, spiritual foodstuff, prasadam. These two things help. And then also young people, generally most people, they need to get married. So let them get married and that way they can go on with their lives. Okay. Okay, any other question? Okay, then we'll go on to this next mantra, which is a very important one. And it's, it's quite a long purport here. Mantra number 11. Vidyam cha vidyam cha yas tad vedo bayam saha avidya yam ritam tritva vidya yam ritam ashnate Only one who can learn the process of nations and that of transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. So you can see the, the difference between this mantra that the fir first mantra was condemning process of uh, material knowledge without proper education. The second mantra was describing that you get one result by culturing, culturing vidya and a different result by culturing avidya. And now this mantra is saying that we have to combine the two. We have to make use of both transcendental knowledge and nations and in this way we can transcend birth and death okay so Prabhupada begins the purport and he talks about uh, the material world how everyone's trying to enjoy a permanent life People want to conquer over the laws of nature. They don't want to be subject to old age, disease and death. And Prabhupada then takes up the example of Haranyakashipu, of course, from the Puranas. We get the example of Haranyakashipu and Prabhupada even tells us the story of Haranyakashipu. And Haranya means gold, Kashipu means soft bed, and all of this. And, and Prabhupada narrates the different uh, 
desires of Haranyakashipu and how Lord Brahma gave him his benedictions. So then Prabhupada says the whole point here is that even Haranyakashipu, the most powerful of materialists, could not become deathless by his various plans. What then can be accomplished by the tiny Harangi Kashipus of today, whose plans are thwarted from moment to moment? Sri Shopanishad instructs us not to make one-sided attempts to win the struggle for existence. Everyone is struggling hard for existence. But the laws of material nature are so hard and fast that they do not allow anyone to surpass them. In order to attain a permanent life, one must be prepared to go back to Godhead. All right, so... Haranyakashipu, the classic materialist, and Prabhupada says today there are many har tiny Haranyakashipus. We all have the same goal of life as he had. We would like to enjoy, we'd like to stay here forever. We should never die. And so it can never be, it can never happen. You cannot go against the laws of the material nature. And Bhagavad Gita also says, for one who has taken birth, death is certain. So we cannot avoid the inevitable. But we can make arrangements to uh, go back to Godhead. We don't need to remain in this material realm which is compared to the prison house of material existence. Mm. All right. The process by which one goes back to Godhead is a different branch of knowledge, and it has to be learned from revealed scriptures such as Upanishads, Vedanta Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. To become happy in this life and attain a permanent blissful life after leaving this material body, one must study the sacred literature and obtain transcendental knowledge. The conditioned living being has forgotten his eternal relationship with God and has mistakenly accepted the temporary place of his birth as all in all. The Lord has kindly delivered the above-mentioned scriptures in India and other scriptures in other countries to remind the forgetful human being that life or, or that his home is not here in this material world. The living being is a spiritual entity and he can be happy only by returning to his spiritual home. So in this way we are being, uh, we are being encouraged. We want to go back to our spiritual home, not to this uh, place of birth and death. We are thinking this is my home. Someone's thinking, I'm Indian, I'm American, I'm Russian. But we're not the body. So we have to be ta attached to our real home. Prabhupada continues, From his kingdom, the personality of Godhead, sends his bona fide servants to propagate this message by which one can return to Godhead 
And sometimes the Lord comes himself to do this work. Since all living beings are his beloved sons, his parts and parcels, God is more sorry than we ourselves to see the suffering we are constantly undergoing in the material condition. The miseries of this material world serve to indirectly remind us of our incompatibility with dead matter. Intelligent living beings generally take note of these reminders and engage themselves in the culture of vidya or transcendental knowledge. Human life is the best opportunity for the culture of spiritual knowledge. And a human being who does not take advantage of this opportunity is called a Naradama, the lowest of human beings. So Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada is telling us very graphically how the Lord is so caring how he laments to see us suffering in the material world. But these miseries of the material world are made just to attract us out of this place and to remind us that this is not our real home. We belong in the spiritual world. We belong in the kingdom of God. We are trying to make our permanent home here in this miserable place. It's our fault, our mistake. So don't try and find happiness here. There is happiness, but it's not in this world. Prabhupada continues, The path of Vidya, or advancement of material knowledge for sense gratification, is the path of repeated birth and death. As he exists spiritually, the living entity has no birth or death. Birth and death apply to the outward covering of the spirit soul, the body. Death is compared to the taking off and birth to the putting on of outward garments. Foolish human beings who are grossly absorbed in the culture of avidya, do not mind this cruel process. Enamored with the beauty of the illusory energy, they undergo the same miseries repeatedly and do not learn any lesson from the laws of nature. So Srila Prabhupada is condemning these foolish people that although there's so much suffering there, they're, they're, they, they're not taking note of it. They're thinking, no, no, it, it's soon, very soon we'll get and People are always thinking, oh, in the future we'll be happy. Any moment now, happiness is coming. Just keep going, just keep running. Very soon it's all coming. The real happiness is going to unfold before you. And people are thinking it will happen here in this world. No, the real happiness is there once you get out from this world. We have to, un we have to understand the, how the illusory energy works how it deceives us. And so we should be concerned how to get free. Srila Prabhupada continues this very important purport. He says, The culture of Vidya, or transcendental knowledge, is essential for the human being. Sense enjoyment in the diseased material condition must be restricted 
as far as possible. Unrestricted sense enjoyment in the bodily condition is the path of ignorance and death. The living entities are not without spiritual senses. Every living being in his original spiritual form has all the senses which are now materially manifested, being covered by the material body and mind. The activities of the material senses are perverted reflections of the activities of the original spiritual senses. In its disease condition, the spirit soul engages in material activities under the material covering. Real sense enjoyment is possible only when the disease of materialism is removed. In our in our pure spiritual form, free from all material contamination, real enjoyment of the senses is possible. A, pa a patient must regain his health before he can truly enjoy sense pleasures again. Thus, the aim of human life should not be to enjoy perverted sense enjoyment, but to cure the material disease. Aggravation of the material disease is no sign of knowledge, but a sign of avidya, ignorance. For good health, a person should not increase his fever from 105 degrees to 107 degrees, but he should reduce his temperature to the normal 98.6. That should be the aim of human life. The modern trend of material civilization is to increase the temperature of the feverish material condition, which has reached the point of 107 degrees in the form of atomic energy. Meanwhile, the foolish politicians are crying that at any moment the world may go to hell. That is the result of the advancement of material knowledge and the neglect of the most important part of life, the culture of spiritual knowledge. Sri Ishopanishad herein warns, we must not follow this dangerous path leading to death. On the contrary, we must develop the culture of spiritual knowledge so that we may become completely free from the cruel hands of death. So Srila Prabhupada has given an important analogy there in the in this last paragraph he's talking about the feverish condition and certainly we can see the example of the feverish condition Srila Prabhupada gives one example here he talks about the uh, atomic energy with particular in Prabhupada's time there was always the threat of nuclear war as there is even today there's threats of atomic warfare releasing act of nuclear weapons against other nations so that's like a feverish condition it's like 107 degrees it's you're just at the point of death practically you know, when your fever gets to that point then you're almost as good as dead so when society gets to that point of almost being almost dead, then our situation, our future is very glim, very grim. There's no future at all. So feverish condition. 
uh, we should understand materialistic life is like a feverish condition. The blazing fire of material existence. So it's like a feverish condition. And we offer our prayers to the spiritual teachers that they like, they're like the rain cloud. Samsara dava nala lida loka trinaya karyana ganaganatvam. That just like the rain cloud pours water on the forest fire to extinguish it. So in the same way, spirit, the spiritual teacher is delivering the rings of mercy. He's getting the mercy of Lord Krishna from the ocean and he's bringing that transcendental mercy of Lord Krishna in the form of transcendental rains through his transcendental instructions to bring us all out of ignorance. So materialistic life is like a fever. You don't want to increase the fever. You want to bring the fever to the healthy condition. So the, there's different things could be done. Uh, some people, they may say, call the doctor, and doctor comes, gives an injection, and then the, the man with the fever may die. Now the doctor may say, okay, fever is gone. The, 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 people, the people say, but, but doctor, the patient's dead. And the doctor simply says, well, fever is gone. So that, that, of course, is not an effective treatment of a fever if the pe person dies. So impersonalism is like that. Impersonalism is to make the fever zero, to stop all desire, to reduce the bodily temperature to zero. Impersonalism is like that. Uh, the proper solution of the fever is to bring the body to the healthy temperature, as proper in 98.6. So Mayavadi philosophy is to make the body temperature zero, to stop all activities. Materialists, they will increase the fever. They will simply want to increase the fever. But the devotee will want to bring the body to the healthy condition. So, Prabhupada said, we need to have the culture of spiritual knowledge that will help us to bring the temperature down. When we cultivate spiritual knowledge and we learn how to uh, control this feverish condition of life. Prabhupada continues, this does not mean that all activities for the maintenance, maintenance of the body should be stopped. There is no question of stopping activities, just as there is no question of wiping out one's temperature altogether when trying to recover from a disease. To make the best use of a bad bargain, is the appropriate expression. The culture of spiritual knowledge necessitates the help of the body and mind. Therefore, maintenance of the body and mind is required if we are to reach our goal. The normal temperature should be maintained, 98.60 sages and saints of India have already attempted to do this by a balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge. They never allow the misuse of human intelligence for diseased sense gratification. So, Srila Prabhupada continues instructing us how 
there's a balanced program. Uh, a balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge. We see from the Bhagavad Gita something of this balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes a yogi does not eat too much or eat too little. He does not sleep too much or sleep too little. So this is something of how we have we should understand the balanced material program can not too much or too little of sleeping or eating at the same time the balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge we could say there is the formula for peace a balanced program recognizing god as the proprietor how everything is for his pleasure and how he is the best friend of all living entities. And there's also uh, the practice of bhakti yoga described in the Bhagavad Gita, spiritual knowledge, for example, also Paramatma vision seeing the super soul within all living entities bhagavad gita describes vidya vinaya sampani brahmani gavi hastini suni chaiva swapaki cha samu pandita darshana that the learned person will see with an equal vision the elephant the cow the dog or the dog eater that's the fifth chapter of bhagavad gita so that is spiritual knowledge and spiritual knowledge is also uh, learning to offer everything to the Lord, offering a leaf, flower, fruit, water with love and devotion, then that is a spiritual practice. So like this, from scriptures like Bhagavad Gita and from the practice of uh, yoga, we learn to control the mind and senses and cultivate spiritual and material knowledge. Prabhupada continues, Human activities diseased by a tendency towards sense gratification have been regulated in the Vedas under the principles of salvation. This system employs religion, economic development, sense gratification and salvation. But at the present moment, people have no interest in religion or salvation. Thus, they have only one aim in life, sense gratification. And in order to achieve this end, they make plans for economic development. Misguided men think that religion should be maintained because it contributes to economic development, which is required for sense gratification. Thus, in order to guarantee further sense gratification after death in heaven, there is some system of religious observance. But this is not the purpose of religion. The path of religion is actually meant for self-realization and economic development is required economic development is required just to maintain the body in a sound healthy condition a man should lead a healthy life with a sound mind just to realize vidya true knowledge which is the aim of human life this life is not meant for working 
like an ass or for culturing avidya for sense gratification. So, and some important points Srila Prabhupada is making, right, that, that, that for the importance of the scriptures, how they guide us in material life. The Vedas, as we mentioned before, the Vedas describe the Purusha Arthas. There is Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. They're called the Purusha Arthas, the goals of human life. So the Vedas describe that, how people can enjoy sense gratification. We naturally want to enjoy sense gratification. We should do it under the direction of the Vedas. Just like in Krishna consciousness, we also have uh, regulated principles to guide us. There is sense gratification. We're allowed to eat. We eat Krishna prasadam. You want to enjoy family life. You can marry and have a child according to religious principles. One can do these things. Everything, everything should be done guided by scriptures, the regulation of the scriptures. How much to eat, how much to sleep. We can be guided by the scriptures. Nothing needs to be left to chance. So the Vedas are there to guide us. But as Prabhupada points out, people are unfortunate that they have no interest in taking advantage of the scriptures. They just simply want sense gratification. All they want is to satisfy their senses. And often people, they have the desire, they would like to go to heaven. They want to go to higher planets. They think, oh, the enjoyment here is not enough. I have to go to higher planets. I can enjoy better there. So, Srila Prabhupada said, economic development should be just enough to maintain the body, to keep the body sound and healthy. Pe but people are so mad for economic development, they always want more and more money. We need the bigger cars, the more expensive cars. We need more homes. We have a home in the city and another home by the sea and another home up the mountain. People are not satisfied today just to have one home. They all keep so many homes. Hardly they can live in any one of them. But they build so many homes. So we should have a balanced life. And at the same time, we need to cultivate transcendental knowledge, vidya. Then life becomes meaningful. Life is not, we're not meant to work hard just like an ass. Of course, we are meant to work. We're not meant to be idle. But we're not meant to be working like animals. We have some dignity. Prabhupada continues, The path of Vidya is most perfectly presented in Srimad Bhagavatam, which directs a human being to utilize his life to inquire into the Absolute Truth. The absolute truth is realized step by step as Brahman, Paramatma, and finally Bhagavan. The absolute truth is realized by the broad-minded man who has attained knowledge and detachment by following the 18 items 
by following the 18 principles of the Bhagavad Gita described in the purport to Mantra 10, beginning with Amanitvam Madambitvam, humility and pridelessness. The central purpose of these 18 principles is the attainment of transcendental devotional service to the Personality of Godhead. Therefore, all classes of men are encouraged to learn the art of devotional service to the Lord. So Prabhupada is describing to us what is Vidya. Vidya means to know the Lord in his different aspects. Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. Learned transcendentalists who know this absolute truth call this non-dual substance as Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. So the, the Lord appears in these different ways. And those who cultivate transcendental knowledge, they'll be familiar with the different features of the Lord. So we're encouraged, we're encouraged to learn how to perform devotional service for the pleasure of the Lord. The guaranteed path to the aim of Vidya is described by Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. The culture of Vidya is summarized in Srimad Bhagavatam in the following words. Tasmat ekena manasa bhagavan sattvatam pati shrotavya kirtitavyas cha jaya pujas cha nityada Therefore, one with one pointed attention, one should constantly hear about, glorify, remember and worship the personality of Godhead, who is the protector of the devotees. So Prabhupada has given us this nice verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter. Text number 14, that the real culture of Vidya is that one should constantly hear, hear about, glorify, remember and worship the Lord who is the protector of the devotees. Unless religion, economic development and sense gratification aim towards the attainment of devotional service to the Lord, they are all simply different forms of nations, as Sri Ishopanishad indicates in the following mantras. All right, so this is Prabhupada's purport here on this very powerful mantra, how we have to cultivate side by side, Vidya and Avidya. Yes, we should know what is Avidya. Now, to know what is Avidya doesn't mean you have to go out and do it. But we do have to learn what is, what to be avoided, what we should not get into. We have to learn that. That is what it means to cultivate Vidya side by side with Avidya. We learn transcendental knowledge and we learn also what is nations, what we should not be doing. Not that we have to go and do it, to, to know, oh, I shouldn't do this. We simply have to understand why we should do these things. So we have to educate our devotees like that, young people growing up in Krishna consciousness, they have to be trained from their childhood. What's that, why we don't eat meat, 
why we don't smoke, why we don't take drugs. We need to have, we have to have a good knowledge on these things. Then we can properly present to other people. So that is what it means to cultivate vidya and avidya side by side. Okay, are there any questions on this verse so far? Anyone? What do you mean, experience? Kāpyam Chagannātha <laughs> Well, we get transcendental knowledge, the, 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 just like Prabhupada gives an example, he says, people are told it's wrong to steal. Now an intelligent person hears it's wrong to steal, he, won't, he will not steal. somebody else who's not very intelligent he will steal and he gets caught and he goes to he may be punished so then he won't steal anymore and another person he steals he gets punished and then he steals again he gets punished again he never stops he never learns that it was wrong to steal but the intelligent person, he simply heard. So he got his experience by hearing. He heard and he understood it was wrong to steal. So he didn't steal anymore. He didn't steal. He never went to jail. He was never punished because he knew it was wrong to steal, that nothing was his. So that is the experience. You get your experience by hearing. It's not that you have to, it's not that you have to go to jail or you have to be caught and punished for stealing to get experience to learn. But if you simply hear properly, then that is the best experience. And you don't need to get any more experience if you hear carefully. So if we hear what is proper, what is not, then that will save us from all the miseries, all the difficulties of material life. Do you understand? Yes, we don't need. But you need to hear. You need to hear carefully. You know, you have to hear, of course, and we could say, well, you have to hear also from the proper source. You have to hear from the prop, the proper authority to 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 guide you and to inspire you, to instruct you. So we heard that you want to acquire vidya, transcendental knowledge. You have to hear from somebody who is dira, from somebody who is not disturbed by the material energy. So if you hear from someone who is an Adira, 
it will not have much effect. Someone who is an adira, who who, who is is in the material world, is very much disturbed by the material world, is in the bodily concept of life, and he's trying to tell you, you know, he's trying to tell you that you're not the body. <laughs> Just like the teacher tells the students, don't smoke. But everybody knows the teacher smokes. So the teacher, is, you know, who's smoking, is telling people not to smoke. His teaching is useless because he cannot teach by example. So the example has to be there. The person who is speaking he has to be convinced that what he's saying is the truth. He has to have, he has to have realized it himself. There was an example given about the mother brought her son to the doctor, and he asked, she asked the doctor, "Please tell my son not to eat sweets. My son eats so many sweets; it's bad for him." So she asked the doctor, can you please tell my son not to eat sweets? So the doctor said to her, okay, come back after two weeks. So the lady had to leave and she came back after two weeks. And then the doctor told the young man, her son, don't eat sweets. So the lady was surprised and she said to the doctor, why didn't you just tell him that two weeks ago? The doctor said, about two weeks ago, he said, I, I like to eat sweets. So I have to give up eating sweets myself before I can tell your son not to eat sweets. If I'm, the doctor said, if I'm going to tell him to do something, I have to be able to do it myself. Otherwise, if I can't do it, my, my instructions won't have any good. So he said, I have to stop eating sweets myself. And then I could only instruct your son. So that like that, you want to guide people, you have to be convinced yourself. Then you can properly guide other people. All right? Maharaj, can yeah. I ask you a question? Yes, please, Prabhu. Uh, uh, Maharaj, uh, in this, um, in the coming days, we go, we having an essay, an exam, an open book exam on, especially particularly on this verse, the number eleven, and one of the questions because it says to explain, you know, how the process of a spiritual life, as, as given by Sila Prabhupada, enable us to achieve a balanced program of a spiritual and material knowledge. So uh, when we read this word material knowledge, it is a bit confusing you know, or could be confusing to us what that means actually. I know you explained something from the Bhagavad Gita in the class, uh, you know, some, some rules for instance for the sleeping or, I don't know, is that material knowledge, what actually it means or, or how important is material knowledge actually in our spiritual life? Because when we say spiritual knowledge or vidya, we of course understand it is nicely explained in the verse, but which kind of material knowledge, uh, 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 how to balance a spiritual and material knowledge, if you can please elaborate a bit more what what kind of material knowledge? Because we may have, we may understand another thing for material knowledge. Yes. Well, I, I would understand material knowledge that it's uh, in relation to the material energy, Lord Krishna's material energy, is described from the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the different elements of creation were given all this information in the Bhagavad Gita and in, in our scriptures. 
our scriptures are full of not only spiritual knowledge, but there's also a lot of material knowledge there within the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, knowledge like the structure of the universe and the 14 different levels of creation created by Lord Brahma. I would understand that to be also material knowledge. Material knowledge is also, we see there's the divisions of society. You have Varna Ashram, Varna, different Varnas and Ashram. This, this is material knowledge. Uh, material knowledge is also, uh, you could regard it also things like the, 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 what, the nature of the senses and uh, how the senses are dominated by the tongue. The, the tongue is very powerful in guiding the senses and material knowledge trains us to recognize how to control the senses. The, for example, the origin of anger where does the anger come from? What what are the three gates to hell? This is all I would in the category of material knowledge. Practice being able to control our mind and senses. I would consider all of these things to be part of material knowledge. Spiritual knowledge is in relation to Lord Krishna. But you can see within the Bhagavad Gita, Lord and in Srimad Bhagavatam also, we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of other information is given. We could say, well, it's all in relation to Krishna. Yes, it's all Krishna's energy, that's certainly true, it's Krishna's energy, but it's also described as Krishna's sep separated material energy. So yes, I would say it is material. Senses, mind and intelligence, you know, the, the five, eight elements of material nature, Krishna's separated energy. So, I would understand that to be, all of these things to be in the category of material knowledge. Yes, Maras, I think you give a very nice explanation. I understand more. Uh, thank you so much, Maras. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So you want to balance spiritual knowledge with material knowledge. Now, if somebody goes too much onto spiritual knowledge, just totally into spiritual, the spiritual aspects, and neglects the material, then the, the, there can be a problem. The problem can, that one may not be fully ready for that yet. Generally, that stage will come later in life, towards the end of life even. One should be ready to uh, give up all material things. So a balanced program means there has to be some interaction between matter and spirit. In other words, somebody may, you have to work, you have to provide, arrange for some kind of income for yourself. Somebody has to, in other words, you live according to Varnashram and you take up some job or else you do some business or you may be a manager or you may be a brahmana. You know, the Varnas, the four Varnas are there. So a balanced program of material and spiritual life. You have to maintain yourself. You have to have some income. You have to have some means of sustenance. So you have to explain how in Krishna consciousness we can do that. That we're able to somehow by the grace of Krishna, somebody can work, find a job working. They can find a job working in the service of the Lord, doing something for the Lord's service. One can become uh, one. One may have to. Uh, they, one may take a job as a teacher, for example, and one can take a job in the school and be a teacher, or one can be a yoga teacher, or somebody gets a job in a restaurant as a cook, or somebody's making prasadam and cooking prasadam, and in this way they earn an income they can provide for themselves. Or somebody else may be doing farming and they may be taking care of the cows and so on. So you have to consider for yourself how you're arranging the balanced program of, of material and spiritual life and under Srila Prabhupada's guidance. Right, so that that, that would be uh, the balanced program of uh, material and spiritual life. You want to be able to explain like that how we want to live in the world, and at the same time, we're practicing spiritual life. We're not of the world. We're living in the world, but we're not caught up in it where uh, we have a balanced program of material and spiritual life. So in this way we're able to enjoy the best of both worlds, both the spiritual and the material. We're not caught up in the material world. We're not simply mad after money. We're not just simply concerned only in our sense gratification, but we, we, we earn enough to maintain ourselves in a healthy life. We're able to meet the needs, both materially and spiritually. As we have material needs, we have also spiritual needs. So balanced life means we're able to meet 
these needs. We're able to somehow generate an income to support our family and to maintain our lifestyle. And we also maintain our spiritual needs. We have time for chanting and we can do our puja and we have time for association and to preach and to study. So I think you can, if you explain this balanced lifestyle, I think that will be nice. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yes, anything else? Anybody? Anything? Okay, there's no more questions and maybe we'll just stop here tonight. And on Monday we'll go on to the, the, the next group, which is uh, mantras uh, 12, 13, 14. Huh? Which will deal with the demigods, the gods and the demigods. We've been dealing with Vidya and Avidya, but now you can, next group will be about the gods and the demigods. So that will be on Monday night. So, okay, if there are no questions, then we'll finish here. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Recording stopped. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna.